So welcome, uh, welcome to our Grand Round series. It, uh, this is one of our special Grand Rounds, which is our Visiting Professor series. Uh, we have a unique opportunity. I will not be uh, having the, I will not have the honor of introducing John. We'll leave that to, to Alan Crandall here in just a moment. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say uh, that John is someone who is one of the bright minds in ophthalmology. Uh, beyond being a bright mind, he's also uh, an incredible person, uh, quality of person. I'm sure he doesn't want me to tell you this. He actually uh, just donated his entire honorarium for coming here to our resident education fund, which is wow. quite an extraordinary gesture. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, John, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure you didn't want me to say I did. that. I did. Alan? Yep. No, it's really a great honor for me to, to uh, introduce John. John has done some uh, even as young as he is, he's done some major, major work in, in glaucoma. Anybody that knows anything about the, the astronauts, uh, that all, every single astronaut uh, has some form of, of uh, optic op nerve pathology, whatever you want to, I'll, I'll let you, I see you're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, related to being in space. And, and it's his uh, role, he went through thousands of, of um, records to discern how what's the problem and possibly how do we fix and make sure because if it if it was like it is now everybody would be blind by the time they got to mars and obviously so there's a lot of work to do but his work with that and the central nervous system connections which will be very interesting for judith i hope she's yeah because he's he'll be talking about right up your alley so and also they have a great fellowship uh, our previous uh, resident, Russ, who's up in, up in, um, was up in Montana, They've, they set up an office for him up there and, and they take great care of, of their fellows and also their, their patients. So it's really a great honor to, for me to have him here to talk about the future. It's very interesting stuff. So I'll leave. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, and before we get started, uh, one of the things that I'd like to say is this place is incredible. Um, you guys have some of the most accomplished, most caring teacher mentors of any institution in the United States. And as a, from a fellowship director standpoint, I think that the best training of residents occurs here in the University of Iowa of any place in the United States. And so. Um, for those that are in training, I said this when it was just our small group, but I'll say it again. You have a responsibility to our profession that's bigger than just going out and doing a good job. That, that, that's the absolute ante for you guys, but being at the best residency program in the best specialty within medicine, and medicine is one of the best jobs in the world in the most prosperous company or country in the world. Um, is a, is a real um, responsibility. It's a, it's a little bit of a burden, but it's really an opportunity. And I, I'm really excited to see what the great things that all of your trainees do. And, um, and you've got, like I said, um, some of the best people in the world uh, here. So this talk might be a little bit different than some of the talks that you've gotten in the past. But how many people have heard the phrase, the dark side of the moon? not just the best Pink Floyd album ever. Um, and it's got special significance now because China just recently landed on the dark side of the moon. Um, what is the dark side of the moon? One of the resins. Tell me what the dark side of the moon is. What does that mean? So it's the side of the moon that's facing away from Earth. So that's right. Most people, that's right. Most people say, that the dark side of the moon is the side that doesn't get any sun. That's incorrect. It's the side of the moon that we never see from Earth. So it turns out that the moon's day and the moon's year, so the day is how long it takes to do a rotation, the moon's year is how long it takes to do the revolution, they are identical. So it does one rotation in exactly the same amount of the time that it takes to do one revolution and what that means is the same side of the moon always faces the Earth and has forever. And I think that glaucoma is not unlike that. We as ophthalmologists quickly forget that the eyeball is connected to the rest of the body. And we spend all of our time in our one cubic inch of the world, and we don't think about it in terms of 
the greater pathophysiology. And so I'm going to make an argument that um, the dark side of the moon is analogous to the dark side of the uh, optic nerve, and we need to think about that. Here's my financial disclosure. So how do you take some um, crazy idea that you have and actuate it? Ideas are really, really fun, and they get your juices going. And there are one, maybe if you're lucky, 2% of the work, and they're the fun 2% of the work. The rest of it is just work. And most of the time, what happens to a brilliant idea is it ends up like this once the work actually starts. How many have started a research project that you were excited about? And four months later, after you've you know, written down a paragraph of the proposal, we haven't made any progress, right? That kind of stuff happens. And the other thing about ideas and, and taking, um, taking a stand on something is that it requires real risk. Not fake risk, but real risk, reputational risk. Risk of how you view yourself if you fail and you thought that you were brilliant and unstoppable. And um, risk of other people's dollars that have invested in you, um, especially if you're doing that from a venture capital standpoint. People invest millions of dollars in you. Did you deliver on that trust that they put in you? But what happens in academia better than anywhere else is that you have an opportunity for lightning to strike. Um, if you're just going through your day from cataract to cataract to cataract to cataract to cataract plus makes to cataract, there isn't an opportunity for that conversation with a colleague for lightning to strike. Another thing that happens in a university setting is you've got specialists that are um, not in your field that can give you ideas. I think that most of the ideas in medicine get translated, uh, are discovered, and if we can apply them to us, or we can take discoveries we made and apply them to other areas of medicine, there's huge opportunity there. I remember when I was a medical student at Mayo, um, a pediatric oncologist came and told me um, that he thought for retinopathy of prematurity um, that maybe um, some of these new anti-VEGF, anti-cancer drugs could be helpful. This is in 2002. I'm like, I don't get it. And, you know, and that's, I, I don't know how far along they were before they were um, injecting medicine in the back of the eye, but the point is that there is somebody somewhere that's thinking uh, across specialties and if you can take that and translate it somewhere else, you can find real big opportunities. So my idea came when I was scuba diving. This is my family. This is uh, taken last year, not when I had the idea. But this is my son, um, who's 10. This is my wife, and that's me. And so I'm down scuba diving, and I'm down under the water 30 feet. And I'm a first year resident at Duke at this time. And I'm thinking, What's going on with the pressure inside my eyeball if I'm down 30 feet underwater? How many scuba divers do we have in here? How much, this isn't a pimp type question, but does anybody know at 30 feet how many millimeters of mercury or pressure the water's putting on you? 10 meters, what? One atmosphere at 30, at 30 feet. 30 meters would be three atmospheres, yep. So one atmosphere of pressure, does anybody know how many atmosphere, one atmosphere of pressure is how many millimeters of mercury? 760, somebody said it, but didn't want to get credit for it because they whispered it. Um, so well, if they're going to be really accurate, they would have said it's about 610 in Salt Lake City. In Salt Lake City, it's even <laughs> higher, we'll get there. Um, so 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure pushing on my eyeball. Now if someone comes in today with a pressure of 60, we're going to drill a hole in their eyeball today, right? So how can I be experiencing 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure on my eyeball and not have glaucoma? How can I perfuse my eye? So I'm sitting there on my one vacation I get during my first year of residency and I'm thinking about this and my wife is pissed because this is what I'm thinking about on the beach instead of enjoying a corona and paying attention to her. And so when we're confronted with something that we can't make sense of, I think we have to zoom out and think about the perspective. And I like this picture because this is true. You shine a red light from over here, this is true. If you shine a whatever color this is, aquamarine light from here, this is true. 
but it does not represent the totality of truth. And if we can zoom back out and start to make the puzzle pieces fit together, we can get a broader view of what truth is. So the common belief is that glaucoma is a one pressure disease, the pressure inside the eyeball. The more likely truth is that glaucoma is a two pressure disease, or at least I believe the more likely truth is that glaucoma is a two pressure disease, a balance between the intraocular pressure and the intracranial pressure. Okay? So when you look at the optic nerve head and you do a histology slide, and this comes from Yost Jonas, here's the intraocular pressure, here's the lamina cuprosa, here's the cerebral spinal fluid pressure, bathing the optic nerve all the way to the back of the eye. And we've spent a century talking about this pressure that affects the optic nerve and very little time talking about this pressure, the CSF, that bathes the optic nerve. We'll talk about one millimeter of mercury difference here and what's happening at night and all of this stuff when the disease occurs here at the optic nerve head. How is it possible that this pressurized fluid doesn't matter? You know that it matters. You know it does because what do we see in um, high CSF pressure? That bladema. The optic nerve bows forward, it swells, axonal transport gets stuck on this side of it. What else do you see um, that looks like papilledema, in high uh, intracranial pressure papilledema? Hypotony, the optic nerve swells, right? If this pressure differential is one where CSF pressure is higher than IOP, the optic nerve bows forward, it swells. If IOP is higher than CSF, what would we expect to see? Cupping. And the optic nerve gets pushed backwards, right? So this is just basic physics. If you have two equal and opposite forces, those forces cancel each other out. No net force is generated. Nothing happens. But if you have a force on one side that's higher, on the force, that's higher than the force on the other side, cupping can occur, glaucoma can occur. So when I'm sitting there scuba diving, what's happening? Yeah, my eye pressure went up 760 millimeters of mercury. But so did my CSF pressure. So did my blood pressure, so did my tissue pressures. All the pressures work in lockstep. So to the point of having, it, having atmospheric pressure being 610 millimeters of mercury in Salt Lake City, 150 millimeters of mercury less than it is in San Diego, people in Salt Lake City still get glaucoma even though the absolute pressure in their eyes is 150 millimeters of mercury less. It's gotta, be absolute, it's gotta be relative pressures that matter, not absolute pressures that matter. But that's not how we think about glaucoma. We think about it as an absolute pressure inside the eye and that's not actually the truth. When we measure the pressure across the cornea, we're measuring a relative pressure. We're saying, what's the pressure inside the eye? How much force do I have to add to the cornea to flatten it, applinate it? And that's the pressure. And so we should really call IOP, we really should call it the translaminar cornea pressure difference. So I go back. And I go back to one of the other glaucoma specialists at Duke. And I say, hey, I have this idea. I think that it might redefine what glaucoma is. He says, you're wrong. Go back on call. <laughs> So, I do just what you learn to do with your parents. I find a different professor. <laughs> and I say, hey, I got this idea about what I think glaucoma might be. And, um, and he says, well, I think you're wrong, but go study it. And that was Rand Allingham. And so he's one of my six heroes in ophthalmology, because he took a risk on this with me. And he was a wonderful mentor. And he just died earlier this year. And so, so I'll cherish this picture, you know, with him forever, me making some argument about some crazy idea and him seeming to buy it. So I went to the Mayo Clinic. Um, I talked my way out of one week of my glaucoma residence, or my glaucoma rotation. I went to the Mayo Clinic in January. I looked at 55,000 lumbar punctures <coughs> over a 20-year period with Doug Johnson. Doug Johnson was also one of the great people and glaucoma specialists. And he died a year after we did this project from um, liver failure, after having a liver transplant. And, and boy, he was one of the good guys. So our original paper has me, Rand Allingham, and Doug Johnson. 
and I'm all that's left. And that really rocked me a little bit. Our time is short. Make sure that you're spending it on things that matter with people you care about. And these were people that I cared about. So we looked at 55,000 lumbar punctures. And, um, and we found that indeed they have a low CSF pressure. The patients that have, a glaucoma, that have glaucoma have low CSF pressure. I'll talk about that in a second. So we get the paper submitted. I, um, we submit it to ophthalmology. I'm here in this building interviewing for fellowship 10 years ago. And it was the day I learned that I was not tough enough to be an academic. Because it's the day that this paper got rejected. And I remember getting the email saying, I was, and I'm like, what do you mean it's rejected? It's brilliant. <laughs> it's, <laughs> there, there's not a hole that you can poke in this thing. And I was dejected. I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, two people Anonymous people have this much power over me and my day. And, and I, was, I knew, honestly, no kidding, I knew in that moment that I wasn't tough enough to be an academic. I'm interested enough to be an academic. I like to do it, but my underbelly is too soft to take that kind of rejection. For, so for those of you that are tough enough to do that, um, kudos to you, because it, really um, it really was hard on me. And so I went back to Allingham and I, wine to him that I thought that this should get accepted. And he called up Henry Jampel and said, how about you have one more reviewer look at it? And ultimately did get accepted in ophthalmology. And so um, peer re the peer review process is not quite as um, uh, unassailable as you think that it is. <laughs> um, and it ultimately did get accepted to ophthalmology and was the lead article in their journal. And so here's what we found. We found that patients that had um, that were normal, had an average CSF pressure of 13 millimeters of mercury, and people that uh, had glaucoma had a CSF pressure of 9.2 that was lower. Okay? And so, uh, highly statistically significant. We then went back and said, well, what about ocular hypertension? What about normal tension glaucoma, right? Doesn't this explain all of it? because 30% of glaucoma in the United States is normal tension glaucoma, 70% of glaucoma in Japan is normal tension glaucoma, and 83% of glaucoma in China is normal tension glaucoma. Okay? Most people that have a high eye pressure don't get glaucoma. Many people that have normal eye pressures do get glaucoma. What's the big picture that we're missing? So if it's this, that normal is Eye pressure of say 15 or 16, CSF pressure of about 13. Glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma is a high eye pressure, a little bit lower CSF pressure. You get that pressure differential across the optic nerve. Normal tension glaucoma is a normal eye pressure, but a bottomed out CSF pressure. And ocular hypertension is a high, without glaucoma, a high eye pressure and a high balanced CSF pressure. So that's why they don't get the disease. So we went back and looked at that. And that's what we found. Indeed, the patients that had normal tension glaucoma had a lower CSF pressure. Patients that had um, ocular hypertension had a high CSF pressure. And so I bring this back to Dave Epstein, who is the chair at Duke, who also you know, passed away a year and a half ago. And, and it was so fun to have a chair that would um, light up and take joy in your successes. And he was, he was one of those people. And so he would have these rounds Monday night and he'd poke at me about this stuff. And, and he ultimately came to believe. So then the questions start flying once you have this insight. What happens to CSF pressure with age? Are there diurnal CSF pressure curves? Does BMI affect CSF pressure? What about experimental models? Can we raise CSF pressure? Can we measure CSF pressure? non-invasively without doing a lumbar puncture. So what does happen to IOP with age? How about some of the residents? Let's start with an easier question. This is maybe a PGY2 question. <laughs> what happens to glaucoma incidence with age? Does it go up, go down, or stay the same? Answer the easy question first, because they only get harder. Come on. It goes up. Goes up. Goes up. <laughs> OK? Makes sense, right? What happens to IOP with age? How many people say it goes up? Residents, how many people say it goes up? 
How many people? Okay. Somebody saw somebody raise their hand. They said, I'm following. The, I'm following. Raise your hand if you say it goes up. Raise your hand if you say it goes up. Raise your hand if you say it stays the same. Raise your hand if it stays, goes down. Raise your hand if you don't have hands. Okay. <laughs> IOP um, increases with age to the sixth decade, after which a decrease in IOP is seen with further age. IOP really doesn't go up that much with age, even though glaucoma in incidence is going up with age. That's curious, right? After adjusting for blood pressure, there was a trend for IOP to decrease with age. Okay, so IOP stays the same. If anything, it goes down with age. That's curious. Since glaucoma goes up with age, no doubt about it. What happens to ICP with age? How many people say that it goes down? How many people say that it goes up? How many people say it stays the same? Okay, so you're right. So this is a paper that we published in IOVS. 14,000 points make up this curve. Here's, what's hap here's what happens to CSF pressure with age. When you're young and you know, these little babies getting taps, um, you know, maybe they're sick or something like that. But basically it stays really, really flat until about age 65. And then it falls off the cliff. So CSF pressure, no doubt, goes down with age, and not only, uh, we're not the only ones that, that showed that. Um, other papers show that ICP seems to decrease with age across all ages. Okay, what about BMI? What happens to CSF pressure with BMI? CSF pressure goes up. This is another paper that we published. Lou Pasquale published a paper in ophthalmology showing that obese women were protected from glaucoma even if they had a high IOP. So, Glaucoma is one of the few diseases that it's good to be chubby, enjoy your cheeseburger. <laughs> um, I think we've all seen the reverse of somebody who's had stable glaucoma and loses a lot of weight. And, and, that, and, and the glaucoma just goes just That's right. Fancy. And we were talking just yesterday about when you see normal tension glaucoma patients, how many of them are slender females? A lot of them are slender females. And it starts to tie this story um, together. So here's Pasquale's paper. Among women, high BMI was associated with a lower risk of primary open angle glaucoma. Low BMI, low BMI was associated with an increased odds of glaucoma. Okay? Now, um, I didn't show one other study, I, I don't think, maybe I'm showing it later, um, where uh, Ning Li Wang uh, from Beijing Tongren Hospital he did a prospective study looking at this. They did uh, spinal taps on patients that had, um, that had glaucoma, and he found the same step out, that ocular hypertensives were the highest, then controls, then glaucoma, then normal tension glaucoma. He published that in the very prestigious um, Chinese Journal of Forced Experimentation. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that's the kind of prospective study that you can get away with, but not everyone believes. So, so I just enjoy this study. And this is where reputational risk comes out. And this is fun. This is where you get in the arena and you get to fight for what you believe in. Don't take offense. Get in there and fight for what you believe. Sohan Heyre has a, he's from the University of Iowa. He has a history of writing pretty uh, pointed letters to the editor. So we publish our letter to the editor. He's also an iconoclast. He, 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 is. Is, he doesn't mind taking shots. He doesn't mind taking shots. He's 92 years old. He still goes into the office. And so I publish, we publish our paper in ophthalmology. He writes a letter to the editor to ophthalmology. They don't publish it. So he writes a letter to the editor to Grafies, which he's the editor-in-chief of, which is kind of not the typical way that you criticize somebody else's paper. So I just happened to come across this, and he's saying you know, that he thinks that I'm wrong. So let's go through a little bit of this. He says, a recent study claimed CSF pressure may play an important contributory role in pathogenesis of glaucoma. But in that study, the difference in mean CSF between the groups was only 4 millimeters of mercury. The concept that a translaminar pressure difference of only 3.8 millimeters of mercury produced by low CSF is strong enough to call Boeing back the dense, compact uh, connective tissue has little scientific credibility. So he comes at me with like a jab. That's probably the nicest one that he's ever written. I reply with a little harder jab, 
and say, we appreciate and recognize the tremendous contributions that Dr. Hay Ray has made to ophthalmology, in particular his understanding of the hot optic nerve. Thus, it's with humble respect that we disagree with his conclusion. This is the jab. Scientific validity is assessed by a well-controlled study to address a hypothesis, not expert opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah, right? He replies with a roundhouse. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is him now saying, this is speculation and simple armchair philosophy. I just love this. I'm sorry to take so much time. Berdahl and colleagues cite Yablonsky in support of their hypothesis. In 1978, Dr. 40 years ago, Dr. Yablonsky and I discussed this at a conference. <laughs> he told me that the entire concept of the pathogenesis of optic disc edema in raised CSF was based on my studies. He wanted me to wanted to ask me about the concept of optic disc cupping and glaucoma. He told me that if raised CSF pressure causes optic disc swelling, then naturally a fall in CSF must cup, uh, cause the reverse. I tried my best to explain to him that this was not true at all because the pathogenesis of optic disc swelling was totally different. However, he was not prepared to accept any scientific evidence contradicting his belief. He presented a paper on this at Arvo, but that was never published. Berdahl and colleagues state none of the colleagues Dr. Hayray cites are designed to address whether a chronic pressure difference across the lamina cabrosa would lead to glaucoma discupping. I do not waste my precious time researching topics that have no scientific logic and merit. In conclusion, therefore, it's evident, contrary to the hypothesis by Berdahl and colleagues, that there is no scientifically valid theory that CSF pressure plays a role in disc cupping. It's what Thomas Henry Huxley called the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> but the facts are what we need, even if they are ugly and unwelcome. I have tried to present in this editorial facts. Okay, so how much fun is this? We get to try and establish truth, and if you're gonna try to be a truth establisher, you're gonna have to fight for it. Nobody has ever not had to fight for it when they're changing how people think. And, you know, all we care about is truth. If we're wrong, we're wrong. And these kind of things test us and help make us better. There is a little bit of disconfirming evidence. So our, our ophthalmology um, paper's been cited, uh, you know, 300 times now with um, only a couple of papers that have shown that maybe CSF pressure wasn't low. This one actually got, um, there's one that got published in ophthalmology that showed that, um, and the title of it was that CSF pressure is not low in normal tension glaucoma. And what they found was that it was lower by a millimeter of mercury in a st prospective study of 11 people. And so it was lower, and, but their title was that it's not low. And so there's um, you know, some disconfirming evidence, but I'll tell you, um, Hey Ray wasn't alone. If you ever want to be humbled, apply for an AGS grant. Um, so, I was applying for a young investigator grant. Um, it's for the people that are in the first five years of practice that have an a outside-of-the-box idea. So I feel like this qualifies. And so I apply for the grant. And, um, and here's what I got in response. Uh, it would be unethical to proceed given the complete lack of scientific evidence that would be achieved based entirely on flawed judgment. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, Rabbits wouldn't wear goggles. How do you, who says? <laughs> Rabbits wouldn't wear goggles, okay? So, so let's think about this for a second and what type of disease is glaucoma? Is it a mechanical disease, a vascular disease, a metabolic disease, a combination? What is it? And when we don't know, we always say it's a combination of a bunch of things, it's multifactorial. To me, that usually just means we don't know. Um, so, um, Harry Quigley and Doug Anderson wrote a classic paper, um, and I think that this was in 1978 as well, um, looking at axonal transport in monkeys. And um, this will reveal how geeky I am, but it's really fun to go back to some of the real old, um, you know, 40 year old literature and read it, because how they wrote was way different then. And it was often much more speculation was allowed. And, and it, it really is fun to, to read how these papers sound different. And we're looking at axonal transport, and what he showed was that indeed, if you raise eye pressure in monkeys, axonal transport stopped at the level of the lamina cribrosa, okay? And, and then the apoptotic mechanism occurs. But what he also showed, which was really interesting, was that um, if you lowered the eye pressure for just four hours, for one hour, about 
half to 70% of the metabolic accumulants were gone. If you lowered it for four hours, it was 100% gone. So what I wonder, and I don't know that I'm right about this, but I wonder, is glaucoma really a 24-hour disease? Or is it a disease where if you can normalize that pressure gradient for a period of time, you allow axonal transport to resume. You deliver the metabolic needs. You remove the metabolic waste. It's like getting a breath. It's like kidney dialysis. It prevents the apoptotic signal from being sent, and people ultimately don't end up getting glaucoma. So if you think about the eye bone being connected to the brain bone by the optic nerve, and that axonal transport is a two-way mechanism, and you have a normal eye pressure and uh, a normal brain pressure, you go up that pressure gradient, no problem. Kind of like just a salmon swimming up the river. If the pressure in the eye is higher or the pressure in the brain is lower, it's a little bit harder to get up that pressure gradient, but you get there. But if the eye pressure is really high or the CSF pressure is really low, then axonal transport is stopped. It can't get up that pressure gradient. The accumulants back up. The metabolic needs aren't met. The apoptotic signal is sent, and the optic nerve dies. And the same is true in reverse with um, orthograde axonal transport. If CSF pressure is high, the axonal transport can't get up into the eye. And that's been shown. And now it's been shown um, in more and more studies experimentally. This is the, um, um, an experiment, um, an animal experiment, where they showed that indeed if you lower CSF pressure, axonal transport stops at the level of the optic nerve head. Even more so than if you raise IOP the same amount. So there's lots of studies that have been done. This has been done, this was done by uh, Bill Morgan in Australia. He showed that indeed there is a pressure gradient that exists across the optic nerve head. He cannulated the vitreous, then the anterior optic nerve, the lamina cribrosa, the posterior optic nerve, the subarachnoid space, and showed that indeed there is a pressure gradient that does exist. There, um, this is an experimental study in monkeys showing that if you lower CSF pressure, there's thinning of the optic nerve um, and neuro neuroretinal rim uh, thinning. Um, this is that study by uh, Rujan Ren and Ning Li Wang showing uh, similar data to what we have in their prospective study on, on this in humans that they lower CSF pressure. Um, optic nerve sheath diameter has been shown to be smaller in glaucoma patients, indicating that perhaps the retrolaminar CSF pressure is lower there. And so um, when I think about all of this work, I think back on some of these people that, that believed that we should try to find out if it was true or not even before they did, and the risk that they took on me. So I come out of residency, and I'm feeling really good. And I remember actually sitting in, in Dr. Olson's office um, talking about this. And he said, you seem really passionate about this. And I was, and, and that meant something to me. And he said, you can tell a difference between a research project where somebody is just doing it to put it on their CV and a research project to actually, because they're interested in trying to accomplish something. Okay, so I get done with residency. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm applying to fellowships. I get accepted to fellowship um, with Dick Lindstrom and Dave Harden and Tom Samuelson at Minnesota Eye Consultants. And, and it was a wonderful place with uh, wonderful humans and three more of my of my heroes. And so a couple months in, I scheduled an appointment to sit down with Dick to, to tell. And, and for those of you that don't know Dick, he's one of the real um, amazing people that you'll ever meet. He is loyal, and he is smart, and he cares about the good. And sometimes he takes some arrows, because, like you, because um, you don't have to take any arrows, because everybody loves what you do. But, but um, but he cares about what's doing right, and because he's such a big person in our profession, he, he does take those arrows, but he's amazing. And so I sit down with him, and I put together this 10-minute PowerPoint to make the argument that CSF pressure matters in glaucoma. And I get done, and he says in his really deep voice, John, I think you're right. I'm like, all right. Said, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, what do you mean, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to get credit for it. People are going to think that I'm smart. And that's what I'm going to do. 
And he says, well, I live in a world where we like to take these scientific discoveries and translate them into something that can actually help people. And I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he says, that's OK. Opportunity favors the prepared mind. Be prepared for when that opportunity presents itself. So what? So what am I going to do? So I go through the next four or five years thinking, what can I do to help treat people that have glaucoma because they've got a low CSF pressure. And so I'm laying in bed one night and I'm reading the Wall Street Journal on my iPad and there's an article that says astronaut shortage. And I say, I'm always looking for a job. I wonder what the skinny is. You know, why are, what's the problem? And they talk about how astronauts are losing vision up on the International Space Station during long-term space flight. And I'm like, uh, and they talk about, you know, the pathledema. And I say, I think I know why. It's because their CSF pressure's high because there's no gravity pulling their CSF pressure down. So it's amazing what you find in Google. I find the highest ranking persons at NASA's email address that I can find who's in charge of astronaut health. And, um, and I email him and I say, hey, this is John from South Dakota. I think I can help you. And no kidding, he emailed me back. And so we set up a call, and then um, ultimately I got invited to be a part of the Vision for Mars program, so I get to go down and meet all these astronauts. And so this is the, that syndrome. It's now called SANS. It used to be called VIIP, and it's really four things. It's choroidal folds, it's a hyperopic shift, it's globe flattening, and it's papilledema. So what does that sound like? Sounds like hypotony, right? Well, hypotony, if you look at it through the lens of CSF pressure, is just when IOP is lower than CSF. So it's that same kind of scenario. So this is, what the, this is one of the astronaut's eyes after he got back. And these are the four things that you see in that. So what would be a treatment for that? Gravity. Gravity would be a great treatment. Or raising eye pressure. Right, so that it balances out CSF pressure. So or I, lows, lowering. Or lowering CSF, CSF pressure. So something like maybe Diamox. <coughs> Diamox, or, yeah. but Diamox will also lower IOP. Sure. So may, maybe it Nat differentially maybe lowers it. Um, uh, uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunt could maybe do that. Maybe astronauts <laughs> don't want one of those. You know? so, um, and they're pretty particular about experimenting invasively on astronauts while we're up in space. So the idea you know, is, is really a simple one. It's this. As we're all sitting here, our CSF by gravity is pulled down into our caudal spinal column. CSF pressure at eye level is um, lower. In space, there is no gravity pulling the CSF down. It redistributes up. And so at eye level, CSF pressure is higher. They never saw it on short-term space flight because it wasn't enough time to cause the problem of the accumulants of metabolic and axonal transport. But um, on, uh, at three months in space, about 50% of the astronauts are experiencing some of these sim uh, symptoms. Women less likely to experience it than men, um, probably because they have lower CSF volumes, a lower um, column of fluid because they're shorter, and they have lower CSF pressures to start with. Okay? So we go down to NASA, and we, um, uh, we get a $100,000 grant for this crazy idea that I have about raising eye pressure, and we'll talk about that in a second. And we published a paper in this journal, and I would highly recommend this journal. I love this journal, the Journal of Medical Hypotheses, because you don't need any data to publish in this <laughs> journal. All you need is a hypothesis. So you can come up with your idea, try to support it, and that's what this journal is intended for. And, um, and I, really, I really do like it. So I'm sitting in my office, and this is my partner, Vance Thompson, and these are the plains of South Dakota with the Missouri River in the background. And Vance is uh, one of my other heroes in ophthalmology and one of the really, really good guys. And for, your, for residents that are choosing a job, we talked about this, but join somebody like him. Join somebody who is going to take as much joys in your successes and be rocket fuel for your career like he has been for me, not someone who wants to suppress you. And so we're sitting in the office and we're talking about, all right, what can we do? So what that this CSF pressure thing is there? And we're talking about astronauts. And he says, well, what if we just put them in a pressurized room? And we pressurize the room. And I said, well, they answer. That's going to pressurize their eye, but it's also going to pressurize their CSF. So it'll move in lockstep. That's not going to work. He's like, okay. 
What if we use a helmet and pressurize a helmet? Well, Vance, it's going to pressurize the eye and it's going to pressurize the head and they're going to move in lockstep. And so I say, well, what about a pair of goggles? What if we could just pressurize the eyeball but not the CSF? So that's what we did. We went down and we looked at, um, uh, we, I bought a bunch of stuff off Amazon and a little pump and put a pressure goggle together. We got $100,000 from NASA. We got $450,000 to study it from friends, family, and fools um, that said, hey, I'm willing to invest in your crazy idea. And, and we're on the way to a company that we've now raised $17 million for. And if you think that there's um, pressure in academia from Sohan Hayre writing not so nice things about your idea in a paper, try taking $17 million from venture capitalists. <laughs> That's real pressure. So the idea is this. Atmosphere is like a cosmic thumb pushing on our body. It's pressurizing our entire body. Okay. And so all we're going to do is release a little bit of pressure over the eye by drawing a vacuum. Now the atmospheric weight is not pushing down as hard in our eye, but it's pushing down the same amount everywhere else in the body. If I pushed my thumb on your eyeball, what, go, what happens to your eye pressure? What if I release my thumb? What happens to your eye pressure? It goes down. It goes down. Pretty simple concept, right? I mean, it, it's really, really straightforward. So the idea is this. If you think about it in absolute terms, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. The eye pressure is 16 millimeters of mercury higher than that, 776. And intracranial pressure is, say, 12, so that's 772. We think about it this way. Ambient is zero. Eye pressure is 16. CSF pressure is 12, you got a pressure differential right here of four, no big deal. You put on um, glaucoma, and that 16 goes up to a 22, that 12 goes down to a nine, now you have a pressure differential here of 13 millimeters of mercury, and the optic nerve doesn't like that, and it slowly deteriorates. So if we took and applied negative 10 millimeters of mercury to the eye, take that 22 down to a 12, leave the CSF pressure at 9, we've now normalized that pressure gradient. Pretty straightforward. Okay? So the first thing that I did is I went and went over to Germany and there's a company that has wireless eye pressure sensors inside the eye. We took my kind of Amazon garage created ones. We went over there, we dialed the pressure down, 2 millimeters of mercury, it went down 2 millimeters of mercury. Dialed it down 2 more, it went down 2 more. I got the phone call, I wasn't there when they did it, I got the phone call at 4 a.m. laying on my couch saying we can dial in eye pressure to what we want it to be. We presented this paper for, or this data for the first time at the AAO conference this year. Here's what we saw. This is 51 patients in a consistent cohort. One eye with goggles with vacuum, one eye with goggles that didn't have vacuum as a control. Um, pressure was 16 millimeters of mercury beforehand. We dialed in 25% of their baseline. So think of this as we're dialing in 25% of that at minus 4. We take their 16.2 down to 13. Control I stays more or less where it was. We dial in 50%, so dial in minus 8. We take it down to 11 and a half. We dial in minus 12. We take it down below 10 millimeters of mercury. And so we just can dial in the eye pressure to where we want it to be. After you take the goggles off, the pressure goes back up to normal, and a week later it's normal. Interestingly, we've been seeing this kind of positive after effect of a little bit lower eye pressure afterwards. I don't have a good way to explain it, and I'm not willing to hang my hat on it, but I am willing to hang my hat on the fact that we can lower eye pressure. So we believe that this technology will be helpful during a vulnerable time, which is nighttime. Nighttime is a time where IOP goes up, medications and surgeries don't work as well, blood pressure goes down, and it's a third of our existence. So we think that this will be an adjunctive treatment <coughs> to glaucoma, or especially for hard to lower IOPs. Somebody that's had a tube, somebody that's got normal tension glaucoma, and they're at 13, and they're still getting worse, and we think... What does CSF pressure do during the night? You'd think it would go up. It does go up a little bit at night, um, just like IOP goes up. And so I think about CSF pressure and aqueous, uh, you know, cerebral spinal fluid and aqueous as very similar. Embryologically, they're similar. Compositionally, they're pretty similar. And they have a tendency to go up and down together. 
I thought CSF during the daytime was about five, and at night it's about 15. That's a threefold increase. Yeah, so um, CSF pressure during the day is about 12 millimeters of mercury, and it raises an interesting, um, and it raises an interesting point. One thing that you could ask is, why haven't we thought about this before? Usually, what are the units for CSF pressure measurement clinically that we use? Centimeters of water or millimeters of water, one of those two. And so here we have millimeters of mercury. And so because we were comparing units that weren't um, comparable, we maybe didn't see a connection that we would have seen otherwise. But CSF pressure during the day is about 11 to 12 millimeters of mercury. OK. So when you're trying to take an idea and execute it, what do you need? Well, you need to solve a real unmet need. And we think that there is an unmet need here. We think that we have good control of IOP. We're going to be able to monitor this in the future. So the pump has a 4G antenna built in to monitor compliance and also to monitor whether or not um, people are actually getting worse over time. So how often do you have to wear it? Is eight hours a night meaningful or is it not? So this is where we hope to end up. But once you get bit by some of these ideas, it's hard not to keep going with it. Let me just see how we're doing for time. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, it's hard not to get bit by these ideas. So we've got a couple other companies um, that we've started. And I would encourage you to go after these things, because it's really fun and icing on the cake. One is really easy. This was a stigmatism fix. I was a math teacher. And um, when I was a fellow, Dave Harden said, you're a math teacher. I've got a toric lens that's misrotated. Figure out where I should rotate it to. OK. So I put together this big, ugly, wonky spreadsheet with a lot of arc tangents in it. And, um, and then I got sick of emailing this to everybody. And so we put it on the website for free, or put it on the web for free. And 1,000 surgeons a month go. And, and it's a real issue, is, is residual stigmatism after cataract surgery. So 1,000 a month. Alcon licensed it. They're potentially going to put that in some of their um, new diagnostic devices. This one's kind of fun, too. So um, this is the MKO melt. Um, what it is is Versed, Ketamine, and Zofran underneath the tongue for sedation for cataract surgery. So we don't start an IV in 98% of our cataract patients. We just give them this. The ketamine is really nice because they have a tendency to gaze and stare at the light. They get a little analgesia, and they get a little euphoria. <laughs> and they don't have to have an IV. And so um, this um, is going to get spun out of Imprimis into its own um, company, and they're going to go for an FDA approval. And we're really excited about that having meaningful impact, not just in ophthalmology, but maybe in the emergency rooms or minor surgical procedures elsewhere. And then the final one is this thing that we just started, which is a way to get online second opinions. Um, and so right now, you have a person in rural wherever, and their local doctor says, you got Fuchs dystrophy, and you should have a cornea transplant, but they didn't have a good connection. This um, tries to introduce a marketplace to medicine where you can say, I want an opinion from Alan Crandall, and it costs X. I'm pretty sure you would probably charge five bucks, because <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's a little <laughs> steep, because of how beginning you are. But really say, I want access to some of the world's best doctors. I want them to review my records. I don't want to have to travel. I want to be able to get in with them. Doctors set their own price. Patients choose which doctor <laughs> they want. And we're going to see if we actually get people to transact or not. So when you're thinking about how you start your own company, there's a couple of things that you need to look at. You need to look at a market. Markets are real. And so if it's going to be a company, it has to have a market. Um, how are you going to protect yourself? What's your motivation? What are you really doing this for? Because it's hard. Get mentors that are going to help you. And ultimately, you're going to have to have some capital. And I'm going to squeeze through the last five minutes really quick, because I think it's the most important stuff. And this is usually the favorite um, talk that I give. And it's the next part's with my dad, usually, but he couldn't be here today. So my question for you about whatever ideas that you have is don't be a DWI. That's a doctor with an idea. Be a doctor that does something with it and executes. So what are you going to do about it? OK. So when's the last time you felt vulnerable? All of this stuff is because we serve patients. So when is the last time that you felt really vulnerable? You know, we're all kind of bulletproof, especially the younger trainees. But when did you feel like something beyond your control could shatter your life? And so my dad um, came in to see me when I was a first year resident, and I was at the VA at Duke. And 
and I did an eye exam, and I looked at his left, and I looked at his right, and I looked back at his left and right, and I'm just staring at this, thinking, I'm not sure that I know what I'm seeing here, but I'm pretty sure you have Fuchs dystrophy. So, Dad, you have Fuchs dystrophy, you're probably going to need a cornea transplant someday. This is my dad, and I think this is interesting insight to what patients do. He said he's never heard of Fuchs dystrophy, so he goes home, and he says, am I the only person that has this? Obviously not, because it has a name. And who are other people that have this? Mandy Patinkin um, is one of those people that had um, a cornea transplant. He had it for keratoconus. And so he was diagnosed in Fuchs dystrophy. And then in 2010, he was hired by our local eye bank to evaluate corneas. And um, that's when things became real, because every cornea he was evaluating, he was thinking, should I, w would I want this cornea in my eye? And so his vision wasn't bad, only 20-25, but he's driving around at night, and now he is um, the outreach coordinator. So he's driving around the state of South Dakota at night, and he can't drive, and my mom's with him. He brightened his test down to 2,400. Fuchs dystrophy is the poster child for visual acuity not being a complete measure of visual function, because a lot he's seeing his acuity is good, but he can't function. And so I say, Dad, are you seeing OK? And he says, no, I'm not. We need to do something about this. So I'm going to talk real quick, and I'm going to move through it quickly so we're done by um, 9. But I'm going to talk about three people, my dad, my mentor, and my father-in-law. And so, when, so I end up saying, Dad, do you want me to do this surgery, or do you want somebody else? And um, I'll get you to the best people in the world. He says, no, I want you to do my surgery. So does anybody know who this is? This is Felix Baumgartner. And he held the record for the highest jump from space to Earth. And when you're about to do surgery on your dad, it kind of feels like this when you're going to do a cornea transplant. <laughs> and right about here, you feel committed <laughs> to the plan that you have. But uh, you know, especially to the trainees, rely, um, rely on your training. Take that plunge. Do things that make you feel uncomfortable but acquire the skill to get comfortable, because inevitably things will start spinning out of control. And when they spin out of control, you have to be able to control yourself in order to end up with, um, with a happy landing. And, and that's what ultimately ended up for him. So I'm not gonna show you his, his video, this is his eye, but his cataract surgery and cornea transplant went great. And, um, and this is what he looked like one week afterwards, and he's got this tiny little partial detachment, so we put an air bubble in. This is what his endothelial cells looked like um, after his DMEC. That's what they looked like before his DMEC. So the second time around, you could tell how nervous he was. He had gotten one of those MKO melts, and, um, you know, he, uh, <laughs> that, that's before surgery. And he's just sitting there snoring <laughs> away right before going into the operating room. So he ended up 2020 minus two, uncorrected. I actually did his second eye with a little bit of monovision. Um, so he doesn't need glasses for intermediate or distance. He just needs them for up close. Um, I'll skip through a couple of these things a little bit. But as the outreach coordinator, he reaches out to all of the recipients. And he got this card one day that said, I opened, um, uh, I opened two gifts this morning. They were my eyes. What we do here is sacred, and people value that. And this is a letter that he got from one of, um, one of those recipients, and I am going to read it quickly. First and foremost, I'm deeply sorry for your loss. I send my sincerest condolences to your family. So these go get distributed through the eye bank to the donor family. I've been legally blind since I was 15 with keratoconus. I'm 32 years old now, and over the years, my vision got very bad. I recent, a recent turn of events led me to look into eye surgery. Before then, I was in a hopeless state of mind and just never <coughs> Um, in May of 2016, I underwent my first cornea transplant, and to date it has been very successful. I still have ways to go before I get my right eye done. Needless to say, my hope has been restored, and I'm working on turning my life around. I will be uh, completing my GED soon and entering the work field. I am told, 32 years old, I'm told that there is a chance I will be able to drive after my next surgery. I can't express enough how forever grateful and thankful I am to your family. It goes without saying that if at all possible, I would give this all up for you to have your lost loved one back. 
I want you to know that with this opportunity, all of this will not be for nothing. Thank you so much for helping restore my hope, and I will do my best to make the most out of life. In the daily grind of what we do, this is lost a lot of times. And reminding ourselves of how sacred it is, he's 32 years old, didn't have a GED, didn't have hope. He got his life back because somebody made a donor. And so eye banking is really a special thing that allows miracles to happen. And there are unsung heroes, and ophthalmologists are not part of that. We are sung heroes, right? We get so much credit, but there's people every night that get up in the middle of the night, drive through snowstorms to recover tissue so that we're not annoyed that we get it five minutes late when we're in the operating room. And it's really, really um, special, the work that they do. So as we transition to this, I get an email from Dick Lindstrom a few years ago. John, in his deep voice, I would like to come and see you do D second DMAC. I especially want to see how you use SF6. I still have more rebubblings than I would like, so time for you to be the teacher. What days do you operate? If we planned ahead, could you bunch up some cases? Would also be fun to see you in the OR in action. Maybe send me your D second DMAC op report and any reading you think I might find useful. Best for me is a Wednesday or Thursday, but I can do anything. I'm available October 7th, 8th, 28th, and 29th if those work. <laughs> your friend Dick L. Okay, so I feel like I get an email from the king and he's coming to watch me and I'm so impressed with myself. And when I got over myself three days later, what I realized is that this is a guy who loves the process of being great. If someone doesn't need to transition from DSEC to DMEC, it's the 70-year-old Dick Lindstrom. But he says if he's going to do it, he's going to do it as good as he possibly can. And he came and he was the single best observer that I ever had in, in the operating room. It was incredible. And so now, isn't this amazing? My mentor teaches me a skill that I use on my dad and then get to go back and help him become better. And Alan was talking about how um, he's having a fellow that was trained by his son and, and it is just this circle of life that we get to go through that is so incredibly special. And then I'll end with this. Um, and this is a little personal and a little um, insight. So this is the most powerful thing that happened to me in medicine. This is my father-in-law. His name's Tom Dirks. This is him dressed up. He is a redneck and he delivered newspapers all of his life and, um, and he was a great guy and he was the pillar of his community in a poor community and people just went over to him and, and he would pay somebody to mow his lawn so that, he could, so that guy could pay his rent or get food. This is my son Tommy who he's named after. And so he died four years ago, five years ago maybe now. And, um, and he died and my wife gave the eulogy and she gave an amazing eulogy. And afterwards, I go out and one of his friends is just bawling. His name was Steve. And Steve, um, I said, how you doing? I gave him a hug. He said, I'm doing terrible. I miss Tom so much. I've just been sitting here all day long listening to the song Spirit in the Sky because it was one of his favorite songs. I gave him a hug and I said, I'm sorry. So now, fast forward a week later, I'm in the operating room and I'm getting ready to do a full thickness cornea transplant and I look at the donor sheet. And on the donor sheet, um, it's his cause of death and it's his time of death and it's his date of death and it's my father-in-law's cornea that I get to implant into somebody else and so he gets to live on through me through that. And so I sit down at the microscope, and, um, and I'm sitting there, and no kidding, 10 seconds, oh shoot, the music didn't, yeah. So 10 seconds after I start the surgery, the song Spirit in the Sky comes on the radio. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, is that for real? And who knows if it is or if it's caught, but what we do, is bigger than the moments that we're in every day. So don't let the grind and the moment um, dilute the sacredness and the trust that patients put in us. So in closing, be committed to what you do, like Felix Baumgartner jumping out of that you know, space capsule. Fall in love with the process of becoming great, not greatness itself. Do the work to be awesome. 
Um, you are a hero, but there are so many other people that are heroes. And, and don't forget the power that your words have and how you can influence somebody's day. And finally, what we do is sacred. So it's really a huge honor for me to be here with you guys today, and thank you for listening. So John, that's fantastic, and uh, obviously great lessons for us all to remember. We often get locked up in our detailed life and uh, don't get back and get a chance to look at the bigger picture. So uh, following along what you've said, and is Boopy still here, uh, so when we do an optic nerve sheath fenestration, obviously because we're concerned about permanently lowering the um, ICP, uh, do those people who have that then, are they at greater risk for glaucoma, or is I, that an unknowable? I, I, we don't I, know that yet. I, I don't think we know it yet. Um, we do know that uh, ventroperitoneal shunts have shown acceleration of glaucoma after people have shunts. Okay. And so, actually, when I was at Mayo doing this study, I called Rand Allingham after I analyzed the data, and I said, look, he said, I saw a patient yesterday, I couldn't believe it, they had a VP shunt placed, three months ago when their glaucoma fell off the table. Okay. So, Randy, in those fenestrations, of course, you're going from an extremely high CSF to a lower CSF. And ultrasound studies, Roger, if Roger's here, we, we published this a while ago, it shows that you get a filtration, but then the filtration seals up. So it's not like you're creating a widget. So you're not creating an abnormally low, you're just bringing it back to a normal level. So the estimate was about three, within three months sort of seals itself off. Interesting. That buys you the time to get. But, but, but here we're reducing pressure from extremely high to a, a lower level. John, it's interesting when you talk about the astronauts. Captain Kelly, who spent a year in the space station, wrote a really interesting book. And they have chronic problems, not only with flattening the eye and the hyperopia, but he says you chronically feel like your head is totally right. full, and you can't think, and you have a chronic headache. And they're putting them in pressure suits now and having them do exercise. And he was saying that when they were doing that, subjectively, he was feeling tremendously better. So it'd be interesting to see what that does to any kind of a, you know, an ultrasound or an OCT of their optic nerves and their posterior. That's uh, right. Sclera. And they also have negative pressure body suits that kind of create a down. negative pressure so fluid um, comes down. And if you look at an astronaut before, um, before takeoff and five days afterwards, you will see that they look um, all, almost like um, uh, well, they've got swollen faces and, and they look like they're you know got too much steroid. Almost right. cushionoid, yeah. Right, because all of, almost cushionoid because all of that fluid redistributes upward. And and you know interestingly you know our valves and our veins and stuff you know we have valves down below our legs but not always up above and so we're designed for gravity. We're not designed for no gravity. Um, that uh, guy, uh, Killer, I think he's... Yeah, Hans-Peter Killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did some really interesting studies of... CSF flow. Uh, CSF flow, but, and the possibility of a kind of loculation and entrapment of CSF uh, around the optic nerve during elevated screening pressure, specifically with regard to the potential sort of nutrient stasis mm -hmm. um, in the CSF around the optic nerve. That's sort of an interesting yep. thing that has also not been kind of brought into this. Number two, um, there is a phenomenon of people who have chronic papilledema long term who get shunted for all the right reasons and then who rapidly go blind in one or both eyes over the course of a couple of weeks. Completely mysterious, have no idea why that happens. It's just the most devastating because they go seriously blind. Um, is, is the nerve dying off? I mean, what, what's yeah, the... Yeah, it, it just... The nerve it, just... It becomes chalky white. Um, is there cupping associated with it? Eventually, yes, as with many phenomena. Uh, because their intracranial pressure is great. The question is what the possibility that's sort of been raised by this ICP IOP thing is whether their IOP, <coughs> their ICP is too low. Right. Which as far as a neurosurgeon is concerned is not an issue. Mm. Right? Why would low ICP be a problem? But uh, and a third thing is there have been a couple of cases of people who their shunts, for other reasons, their shunts are overdraining, and they can get a progressive optic neuropathy 
and you can not reverse it, but halt it by readjusting their ICP. And, and to me, I think that a lot of this is around the pressure differential. You know, another question is, do we have a compartment syndrome going on? Is there a segmentation of the intra orbital part of the nerve from the intracranial part of the nerve. And if the CSF pressure is too low, maybe it can't just get into that backwater area that's surrounding the optic nerve head. And I think that Hans Peter Killer's work is really, you know, fascinating. But but I still think that it I, I still bet that most of this can be explained by what is the retrolaminar tissue pressures and how much flow do we have there? Sleep apnea. Yeah, so sleep apnea um, has a, uh, um, some studies show that it is associated with glaucoma and some other studies show that it's not. Um, you know, it's interesting to me because, you know, people are probably hypoxic and having issues, but they're also probably large and would have a higher CSF pressure. So in my mind, the jury's still out on what CS, uh, sleep apnea and glaucoma's real association. In that group in Germany measured that during sensors. Yeah, they could measure what happens to IOP during, during sleep and sleep apnea patients, and I don't know what the answer to that is. And you know, you kind of wonder if they actually have Valsalva a little bit when they're... Sure. Yeah. They, have, they can have profoundly elevated... Oh, interesting. And there are some studies suggesting a, a relationship between sleep apnea yeah. and elevated brain pressure. Interesting. So, so thank right. you, sir.